Cool. Hi. Um, this is called an agnostic component design system for React. And I'm going to share with you some thoughts uh, and patterns on how can you build fully flexible components, components that are completely ag agnostic from style, only encapsulating behavior so you can reuse it in all of your systems. My name is Javi Velasco. That's my Twitter handle, my beautiful dog. And uh, I work for this company called Audience, but I am also the author of this UI kit library called React Toolbox. React Toolbox is a set of uh, components that implement material design. And at first, it was built as an alternative to this famous material UI library, which is also a material design kit. Uh, but the main difference is that I built this library using CSS modules um, because I wasn't sure about what was the best implementation for styling in a vendor component library, and CSS module sounds quite good at first. So it became suddenly super popular, and some big companies like Amazon, Netflix, and Walmart are already using it for internal dashboards and for their internal projects. So apparently, it's working well for them. That's good enough. But still, in my opinion, being the creator, there are some issues with the library when it comes to styling and deming and customizing components. If you are only willing to use material design, a uh, material design uh, style, that's perfectly fine. But as long as you want to do something a little bit different, you're sold, right? And basically, the most important reason become, it comes from the most important decision, the design decision, which was to use CSS modules. So I wanted to ask how many of you are familiar with CSS modules, if you can raise your hand, more or less, yeah. OK, that's good enough. Um, basically, CSS modules allows you to write the CSS file that you can import from your JavaScript. And it is going to resolve into an object where each key is going to be the class names that are defined in the CSS uh, module. And the value for each of, the, of those keys is going to be like a hash value. So you can use those values to interpolate in the class names in your components. And that way, you can be sure that there are not going to be any collisions, which is a very typical issue when you are using CSS. I thought at first that this could be great for a vendor component library, but there are major issues that I never thought about before. Like, for example, it is going to force you in um, not that easy setup with Webpack. How many of you messed with the Webpack configuration ever? I think that is, yeah, it's a common issue, right? And this is happening because, the, because React Toolbox is requiring the CSS internally. So you should provide a way, after installing the library, to require and parse that CSS. So you have to use Webpack in the first version to use React Toolbox. And that's like my first lesson, the first lesson learned, which is you cannot force people to use something right? that is out of their usual workflow. So. Uh, there's another problem with CSS modules, which is that the fact that you are hashing every class name so they are not going to collide between each other, uh, it's also hiding the implementation of that class name API. So you can't really target from outside of the component and a specific node to change the style. And that's why I built this React CSS Dimmer library, trying to solve this problem. Basically, it's going to give you a customization API that is based on CSS modules. And the basic idea behind it is that as I don't know what are the class names used internally by the component, I'm going to expose um, object, an object API where you can pass the matching between class names and the final class names that you would really want to apply. But the problem with this is that CSS is so great that you still have to deal with priority with the cascade itself. So it's not perfect either. 
But that got me thinking, like, there should be a way to provide a very customization API for every component, right? And uh, at this point, I would like to ask you something. Like, have you ever built a date picker component, like front-enders, ever? Not that much people, but it's fine. And how many of you have ever copied that date picker and changed the styles? That's the most common scenario, right? And my other question is, do you think that it was customizable enough? Like, I mean, really customizable, not only changing a couple of colors. That's easy. More than that. Usually the answer is no, because you build a component for your own system with your own design, and do, you don't have to think about um, how that component can be customized. That's something, that's a problem that vendor providers have to deal with, and not you in your, car, in your usual environment. But anyway, I want to show you something. In React Toolbox, there is a date picker component. It's a, just a date picker component, nothing special about it. But it is material design style component. So I extract all the logic from that component, and I build what you're seeing there. On the left side, what you see is the Airbnb style date picker. And it is using the logic, all the logic that is in React Toolbox, OK? Two months and everything. But in the right side, what you are seeing is a React Native app running a React Native date picker that is using the exact same API, the exact same component in both sides. And usually people is like, holy crap, how do you do that? That's super complicated, looks complicated. So I want to share with you what is the process that, allows me, that allowed me to get to this point. But first, I want to clarify what is the difference to me between theming and customization. What do we understand? Because usually we mix both terms, and they are not exactly the same. So from my point of view, I see three different customization layers when you ship a component. First of all, there is this theming layer. As an example, imagine that you have a set of components and you say, I'm one, I want to change the color scheme of my component, so every component is going to look different with a different primary color. Like, for example, you have a button and a radio, and a radio button using the same color. You can easily predict what's going to be changed. You can say, OK, probably the user is going to want to change the size of this radio button, and probably he's going to want to change the prim primary color. So that's predictable, and that's easy to, to solve. But this is like the first layer. Usually, you're going to have, um, in any vendor component library, a way to provide deming. Apart from that, you have style customization. So picture this case. You say, I can give you a material design card, and you can say, the title is too small. I want to make it bigger, or whatever. Right? Like, I can tell you, no, this is the way the card should look like. But maybe you, don't, you just don't care. You just want to change it, right? So you can't really predict, when you're shipping a component, what's going to be change it, what the user is going to change in the end. So you have to provide some way, some way of like an escape hatch so, you can, so the user can change stuff that is not meant to be changed, but it should be possible to change that, right? Like for example, in this case, this is like the second layer. And there is a third layer that nobody speaks out like ever because it's not that common, but it's a possible scenario. Like, I like the date picker, but I want to change the weekday titles. So instead of using capital letters, I want to use the full names of each day, weekday. right? And that's rendering customization. That's not related to style. That's something that you want to change on how the component is rendering. And usually, you don't have an API to do that, except for now that the render props are so popular. But still, this is something different. So 
to build a fully flexible component, in my opinion, you have to put an eye on these three layers, Deming, style customization, and rendering customization. And if you get a system where you can change those three layers, what you're shipping is a really, really flexible and customizable component. So this will be taking customization to the limits, right? So I'm going to show you how you can get done all of those three layers. But first, let's think about how React faces styling, or how do you usually deal with styles in React components. We were told that in React, the component can be considered as a function of the state. You have this function, you pass on a state, and you are going to render a view. And that's going to happen in JavaScript. We used to have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript separated. But then, suddenly, we forget about HTML. The HTML is going to be generated. And that is going to be done by React. So we can just forget about it and just write JavaScript. But what about CSS? CSS is not a first-class citizen in React. If you want to style a component, you still have to define the CSS part and link it to the component using class names, for example. And you have to import the CSS, make it appear in your site, um, and everything, right? But also, to get deming in this scenario, you need building and setting up. Don't get me wrong. Now we have custom properties in CSS, but you know, not every browser supports it. So you can't really ship a CSS style sheet with custom properties and hope that that's going to be eventually resolved in the browser. So you're going to need building and setting up if you're using this traditional approach. So the CSS in this scenario is not bundled. It is referenced using class names. And what if I tell you that we could take style as a function of the state as well? It makes sense. Just think about it you are deciding in a component what's going to be rendered depending on the state. But also, usually, you are going to decide what composition of class names is going to be rendered depending on the state. And that's what affects how the component looks like once it is rendered. So we can consider the style as a function of the state, too. So my question is, can we handle CSS as React does with HTML? And the answer is yes, with CSS in JS, which is the implementation of CSS fatigue. Right, Max? <laughs> and uh, this, is, this is going to apply to any CSS in JS solution, of course. But I'm going to focus on world famous style components library, right? Yeah, I'm going to focus on style components because, in my opinion, the API changes a little bit the concept, on, changes our mind on how we think about styling in, in general, right? So take this as an example. Imagine that you have this button component. It's receiving some children and a primary property. And it is going to render a button element and then you have this logic here, which is styled-related logic. You are saying, if, my, if the property primary evaluates to truthy, I'm going to add this BDN primary class name and otherwise just BDN, right? But you're putting a style logic in this component, and the CSS is going to be apart from this. And at the end, when you write CSS, you're targeting one element or multiple elements with one single selector, but the final target is going to be an element, a node, a DOM node, right? In a style components, though, it would look, the same thing would look something like this. You use, you import style from a style component, and you say, I'm going to generate a component that is going to render to one single anchor element. And this is the style that this node is going to have. So you are not writing a selector. You are writing a component that rendered to an element that is already styled. But what is super cool about this is that as this is using template string tags, you can interpolate something there. And if you interpolate a function, that function is going to be called with the properties that the component is receiving. 
So you can say, I'm going to generate this button, and when you interpolate a function, if the props that primary evaluates to truthy, I'm going to put that CSS, and this is important because it's that different abstraction level. We were speaking about class names before, and now we are speaking about styles. So it's not the primary class name, it's this style. And both are used in the same way. At the end, you just render button, primary, and you get it done. So the difference is, if you are going to render to an element, or rendering two components, if you are treating elements as the primitive to build your components, or components as primitives to build more complex components. When you're rendering two elements, the style, again, is not bundled, it is linked using class names. You are mapping the, stale to the, sty the state to a combination of class names. And also, there's no building them in, them in a strategy, and overriding is going to rely on the selector priority. But when you render two components using a CSS in JS library and an, and an approach like style components or fila or whatever other library you want to use, the styles are going to be bundled. You don't need to include any CSS. You just import your component, you use it, and you have the styles right there. Also, you are mapping the state to properties. Instead of combining those class names, you say this button component is primary. That's all. And you can uh, you can get Deming for free, because usually the library is going to implement that for you. And also overriding is going to rely on JavaScript, because JavaScript is the one, and the library is the one responsible for generating that CSS and injecting it. So you don't have to deal with the cascade uh, if you don't want to. So that, that's it on one side, right? But from this concept, how can we solve Deming and style customization. So first of all, we have Deming. And Deming, as I just told you, is free in this approach because it's going to be bounded with the library. So take style components as an example. You generate this button, and you can interpolate there a function that receives the properties. And you can say props that dim that main. And that's going to be the primary color, the main color in my app. Okay. But of course, this is, not com this is coming from somewhere. This is not any magic, right? So style components tells you, you can use this DIM provider to let the application know what is your DIM object. So I can say, my DIM is an object where the main color is green. And I'm going to use this DIM provider pattern. I'm pretty sure you are already familiar with it. Um, to let the style components know what is the dim scheme? So that's it. You just pass the dim, and you get deming for free. That's super easy, right? And you can use it with every CSS, any CSS library. But what about style customization? You have many different approaches to deal with that. But one of those is this one, for example, where you can interpolate in the end of your styles a property that is supposed to be a piece of CSS. And uh, in this example, what you can do to customize that button is to declare separately a styles variable, where you are going to use this CSS function, which is provided by style components in this case, to tell this is a piece of CSS where color is black, border radius is 50%, whatever. And what is super cool about this is that you can still interpolate a function in your piece of CSS. So you can say, if I have the primary color, I'm going to interpolate this color, Alice Blue. And later, you can get this style object and pass it to your component. So any style that you want to inject in that button component can be added to this variable and passed down to your to get your customized button. But what about a more complex component? Because obviously this is a component that renders just to one node. What if it's something more sophisticated? And picture this example. Like you have this counter component. And the counter component is composed by two different nodes. 
let's say it can be a div element and a span element, but we are going to use components as primitives. So instead of using a div and a span, we are going to put a name on them and call them as components, wrapper and count. And what we are going to do is to receive this styles uh, property, and we are going to define a contract where we say, the styles, is a, the styles property is an object with a wrapper and account keys. And we are going to use the value that you pass there to propagate those styles to each node. So from outside, what we are doing is designing a contract where your component takes a style object where you can tell what is the CSS that each node can have. You just pass it, and that's all. But notice also that I'm using the same name, like wrapper and styles.wrapper. So that's what you're doing, a contract saying, this node needs these styles. And you can use it like that. You can declare my counter, which is an object, and you can say wrapper is going to have background gray, border, whatever, and the same for count. And later when you render, you just pass that object, and the counter is going to take whatever you're passing in, right? So that solves style customization, because you can, since you are inverting this responsibility, you can even add new properties that are not at first uh, in the component, right? But there is one more thing, which is the most complex one, which is rendering customization. How can you solve that? And here, I want to speak about a concept, what I call component injection, which is nothing but dependency injection for components. So this is the previous example, and we are assuming that wrapper and count are components that render to one node, not necessarily, but let's assume that, and those components are being imported. So if I import this counter component in somewhere, I am already importing a wrapper and a count. And the, the issue here is that I want to customize those two so they can be whatever I want. So instead of importing them, what we can do is to take them out of here into a function, a factory function. So we are not longer writing a component, but a function that returns a component. And in this case, it's a function, getCounter, that is receiving that wrapper and count components. That, those are the nodes that the component is going to use internally. And then you return a function, which is the component itself, that renders wrapper and count, the given wrapper and count. And how do you use this? It's super declarative. Like if you want to create your custom component, you call get counter, passing a wrapper and count that are going to be the result of those style.div and style.span. And notice that we are also interpolating in the end that props styles wrapper. So this way, you'll be generating a counter component that looks exactly like what you're saying there, and you are modeling it flat, but specifying the styles per node instead of using selectors. And the beauty of this is that you can use something else, not necessarily style components. Like for example, in Fila, the code looks almost the same because it's using a similar API, and you're saying wrapper is a component that is a div, and it's receiving whatever props and returning the styles into an object representation instead of a string, okay? So that's essentially the same thing. And what is even better is, then, is that it doesn't have to be uh, React Web. It could be React Native, like in this case with style components native. Wrapper could be a view instead of a div, and count can be a text instead of a span. So that way, you write a function, a factory function that generates a component, and it could generate a web component or a um, React Native component easily. But there is, a, there is a problem, though, which is that there is a contract on how 
those nodes are communicating to each other how you pass uh, handlers on click handlers, for example, stuff like that. And that contract is implicit in the component implementation. So we, we have to have some way to reverse that so we can decide how those components are going to uh, communicate with each other. And to, to show you the problem in a more straightforward way, think about this, like, let's be evil. What if I want to have a red background for my counter component when count value is higher than 10? That's a super weird customization, right? Because it depends on the count value. But the problem is that the background node is not taking the count property. So how can we explicitly say to that factory function, you have to get the count property and pass it to the wrapper component. And the solution for this is to use what I call the pass-through function. So instead of just injecting a wrapper and a count, what we are going to inject is a pass-through function, which is nothing but a function whose contract is. The first parameter is going to be the node name. It's the node in which it's going to be called. The second parameter is going to be the properties that the component, the count component, is receiving. And it is supposed to return an object that is going to be a spread in the rendering. So any property that is returned in the pass-through function is going to be passed as a property to the element when, where it's being called. As an example, this could be a pass-through function implementation. Like, I'm going to take the node name, and in case it's called for the wrapper component, I'm going to return an object that takes, that returns this count key and props that children. What you are doing basically here is telling, get the children property, which is the count value, and pass it to wrapper, to the wrapper node as the property count. And this way, when you implement the real counter, you can use that property in the wrapper styles to say, if props that count is higher than 10, then I'm going to return red. And with that, you're solving the issue, right? Because you can decide how the component is going to be internally orchestrated. But of course, this is not perfect, because the API can become very complex. This is an easy example with a counter, just two nodes. But imagine that date picker that I showed you before, where you have like weeks, weekdays, you have days, you have months, you have a wrapper for the months, the next, whatever. You have a lot of stuff there. So the API, as you start customizing and passing many properties and changing how the properties are orchestrated internally, can become very complex. And you can get to the point where you are not exactly sure what props receives each node. And also the other problem is that you have, of course, to rebuild the internals. Like, you have to tell what is the structure of the component, how the component is going to be rendered in the end. Still, you can browse it using the depth tools. But it's a caveat, right? But anyway, using this implementation, rocks. It's super cool, because you can write a component that is super complex, very complex logic, and at the end get something that can be reused for React Native, and you can change completely the styles. And once it's done, uh, if it's working nicely, um, you don't really have to touch it that much. But still, there's that, of course, problem that the API can become super complex. So back to React Toolbox. Remember that? I build that thing, that React Toolbox thingy. How does this apply to React Toolbox? Basically, I want to release a new version, a new uh, 3 version, uh, which is going to be React Toolbox itself with uh, the material design implementation, all the components that you can just import and use them without messing up with Webpack, with configuration or whatever. You just import the component and use it, and boom, you got it ready. But also, I want to extract, I'm in the process of that, to extract all the behavior into a separate package, which is going to be React Toolbox Core. 
And the claim for this is that you can build your custom React UI kit from a reliable set of agnostic component factories, uh, higher order components, and utilities. Right? Two separate packages, one for those that want to use material design, and the other one for people that want to build their custom components, custom styling, but without, me without messing with all that complex logic that a complex component like a date picker can have. And that's all I got. Thank you so much for listening. And... <laughs>